Guys, it's a rich topic. You will find me speaking on it online here. Thanks a bunch. That's awesome. Um, uh, performance. Um, okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm happy to expand on this tomorrow. Um, and uh, expand on many things. Slide one. I want to talk just a moment about performance issues. ABMs are heavyweight from the standpoint of performance. The performance with an ABM scales at least linearly with the, the number of agents. What that means is it doubles the number of agents. With current implementations, it approximately doubles the running time. That's not a given. Um, people like UGA or people like Winchell have recourse to skills that can actually make that not true, where you divide up the model running over many, many different systems, but not with any logic today. But it is possible to move beyond this, um, at least, as we say, super linear scaling, or, or at least linear scaling with, uh, with interface models through appropriate parallelization to a point. Um, but you should be aware that interface models take, take effort to simulate, and, um, it's, it's for several reasons. One is generally you have lots of moving parts. There's a lot of big state space, right? Lots of things to simulate. And second of all, you've got to run the model several times to develop confidence that you've understood its results well, right? That whole issue of, of, of confidence in the results not being flukes, right? Um, uh, and, and this computational burden has consequence. There's an opportunity cost. If, you know, time spent running the model, if you have to spend and now we're running it, it short changes that ability to learn quickly, run it really quickly and observe. So it, it matters. Um, it, it reduces the time exploring model results and, and getting insights from those results. Um, and, um, and so performance is not a small matter. It's not merely a kind of a little nuisance. It gets, it gets involved in the whole primary value delivery by, by agent-based modeling and hybrid modeling. The point, if, it, if it takes longer, often it, it short changes our ability to learn a little bit. And I want to just t you know, touch on a couple of these things. As I said, any logic suffers from a major performance problem in its support for ABM and hybrid modeling. I haven't dwelt on it, but it's a seriously broken part of our system. It's not that it doesn't work, it works fine. I mean, it, mathematically and in terms of, of, of soundness, it's fine. The problem is the performance is seriously broken. And like the performance is seriously problematic in a way that's gratuitous. It is it is perversely slow when you start scaling up to large number of agents, each of which has a state. And the basic deal, which Winchell could show you or Wade could show you, um, and probably others in the room could show you, is the system dynamics components of the model get recalculated. It's like they wake up and say, I've got to calculate the value of my flows every time an event happens in the model, anywhere. So if one agent, agent A, suppose every agent has a system dynamics component um, in it that is calculating its weight change, like that first model we saw. Um, so it simulates the weight change. Or maybe it's simulating the immune levels, immune defense levels, immune memory. If, if any other agent in the model switches states that it's in, this, the, the um, SD model and every agent gets updated and say, time to calculate the flows. Um, and it goes through every, <laughs> every agent, even though you know, it's like that agent over there didn't have anything relevant to your flows. Um, you would think it would be smarter, but it's not. And it's trying to be careful. I get that. I get that as a software engineer. Ooh, maybe it somehow affected the value of this flow, so we've got to recalculate it. But, but to have that as the default is, is frankly very problematic. And what this leads to, if you have a model where agents have system dynamics within each agent, this becomes untenable above like 10,000 agents or 20,000 agents. It just starts to crawl the model, okay? Um, 
I will note that in that logo, I've been told it breaks down over 30,000 agents just for standard ADMs, but that was several years ago, and I don't know that that's still, in fact, the case. It may be, uh, or it may not be. And it's worth, but it's worth being aware that there were some serious issues about that um, a number of years ago. Um, so the workaround here, fortunately, is very straightforward. All you do is you put into place, once your SD component is defined, all you do is you just write some, you just write out those equations in longhand and you have them calculated in an event and you basically hide or ignore that, um, and that system dynamics model. You might still leave it there visually, but you're not depending on any logics implementation of SD and each agent. And this works great. It works great. Okay? Um, uh, and it scales to much higher numbers, like UN's model, which scales to, you know, the multi-scale hybrid model where you have these rich um, system dynamics component characterizing the insulin glucose metabolism, and it scales to 400,000 agents, 500,000 agents, uh, fine. Um, it doesn't mean it executes in a minute with that, uh, but it will execute in a reasonable time um, for that, and, uh, and it's, it's not really a problem as far as, as learning effectively from it. Um, it does mean that commonly we run with smaller populations in general, and we try to learn from them, and then maybe we go home for the night and we run it with a population of 500,000 um, to, to get results over, over, overnight, okay? There's a set of other things. There's, I don't have time to go into this, but I'll provide you the slides. It's easy to create a model that's perversely slow by making a mistake, and that is initially specifying the wrong time unit, starting to create things that, like, you leave it as a default is seconds. <laughs> and, and so you choose seconds as the time you start creating things in your model that actually, without you noticing it, occur in seconds. And then you go back and you change it to hours. It's not gonna automatically correct those earlier things. And things will be going on in your model needlessly, frequently, like updating graphs every second when really you're interested in years of time. And it's easy to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to fix that mistake by paying attention when you create a model and change it from seconds, okay? Um, and, and this is another, another way, um, uh, well, this, is, this expands on that. Um, uh, you should be aware that any logic, any logic performance of a model is driven in large part, not entirely, but in large part by, by the number of events that occur. And if you're sending needless events, like I, I one time was asked by a colleague, um, sent an email saying, my any logic model is untenably slow, I've got a presentation two days from now, help me. <laughs> and, I, and I said, okay, Winchell, uh, take a look. Um, and actually, I'm not sure, I think I did show it to Winchell at one point. I think I fixed it myself. Um, it took about five minutes um, for me to look at and say, oh, okay, that's it. Um, it was just, it was sending an event, you know, like hundreds of times a day. Each person was sending an event hundreds of times a day and it didn't need to be. And it was pretty clear. Um, uh, in other cases, we run tools on it. So we have these tools that are common Java tools, but they run on any logic. It's one of the advantages of not having a weird language like NetLogo, but, but having Java as our language. And it lets us run these common tools, which are widely used by software developers, and we can kind of diagnose what's taking a lot of time in the model, what's taking a lot of space, what's allocating so much memory. And so if you look at the the tools that the Lugia will run or Winchell will run, um, uh, these, are, these are tools called profilers, and they'll tell you what's going on um, in the model and, why, and what's taking a long time. They give you hints, at least, as to what's, what might be taking a long time in the model. And in fact, that's how I found the problem with her model, um, was, was by using those. Um, okay, um, some other suggestions. Um, uh, so lower event frequency, um, uh, don't have uh, visual elements um, uh, updated that frequently. Um, uh, 
There's some things you can do with clever ways to compute statistics that can do them incrementally rather than doing full sweeps over the population. I mentioned the profiler. Um, you can send fewer messages sometimes. Like instead of me sending a message which only has a 1% chance of infecting the only all of those around me um, because it, it's like contact with pathogen, maybe I only send a message, a, a, a potentially infecting message, one out of, so it's 1% of that rate to people around me. Um, and, and that's approximately the, the same, it turns out. Glad to expand on that separately. Um, uh, so that this expands uh, on that. Um, uh, right, um, yeah. Uh, you can use deliver rather than send, but we didn't get into that. Okay, statistics. Um, it turns out that any logic provides very nice ability to declare statistics for a model. You can basically say, count the number of people who are infected, or count the number of people who are susceptible, or count the number of people who are in this age category and infected. The problem is that if you use this naively, like if you have 17 different age categories, to report how many people there are in each age category alive in the model, it will need to do 17 passes over the population saying, are you in age category one? No. Are you in age category one? Yeah. Are you in age category one? No. Are you? No. And then at the end of that, after for, you know 100,000 agents, they'll come back to the beginning and say, are you in age category two? Yeah. Are you in age category two? Uh, are you in age category two? Uh, um, are you in age category two? You know, and so on. I'm sure my students appreciate the, 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 the animation, um, particularly this time of day. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, if at some point, just be aware the statistics um, are conveniences, but at some point you might want to do it in a little bit of a clever way. And we have some really sweet, clever ways of doing it. Um, if you wanted to ask me about it, and I have models which I think demonstrate them quite nicely. Um, okay, key thing. Any logic visualizations are one of are a real asset of that platform. The ability to visualize what's going on, I've argued, often gives insight. You notice patterns you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. NetLogo has a similar thing. Modgen, you're dealing with tables output from. Not as nice. Um, and repast, well, you can write your own visualization code, but it's not nearly as nice. Visualization in any logic is a significant asset. Um, but it turns out that when you run the model with visualization, it actually takes memory and it, it requires time to run it. It actually requires a fair bit of effort. Do you remember when we had those people sort of riding on their head down the roads? I know that sounds awkward, but it's down under and they're upside down. So, <laughs> it's easy. I've been to Melbourne and I, I can tell you I wasn't riding on my head. Um, but uh, the point is that, um, uh, that visualization takes effort, okay? And it turns out that there's a really easy way to avoid this. And I won't have you open this, but I'll just note that if you go and, um, and create what's called a parameter variation experiment, okay? You go and um, uh, you, you end up um, creating, a, a rather than a regular experiment, you create a parameterization experiment. You will not, basically it will spare you all the effort or most of the effort for updating visual components. It will run the model faster and sometimes very significantly faster than it will when it shows visual, visual pieces. And all you have to do is take your same, same model and say, I want a parameter variation experiment. And don't vary any parameters. Just leave them at the settings you want. It'll run a lot faster for, for many models because it doesn't have to show the pictures. Now, when you want to see the pictures, go see the pictures, regular run. But if you're running it with a big population and you're not interested, like it's running overnight, and seeing it visually presented, run or run fast. You may be able to run it twice as fast or three times as fast because of that. And, and how do you do that? You use a parameter variation experiment. Um, uh, it, it can be a, a tool that will help. And I know that um, Winchell and Wade and Narges uh, and uh, Lutier um, have all run any logic models uh, quite a bit without um, and, and what they call the headless fashion, 
What that means is there's no visualization. Of that. Well, there's no there's no output visual output associated with it, and it turns out you can run it often quite a bit faster, and um, and you can um, you can gain benefits from that in terms of running multiple things at time uh, in a faster uh, faster way. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so you can do new parameter uh, parameterization experiment. Okay. Um, uh, Output of data, yeah, it turns out that outputting to databases, any logic is built in databases and outputting to them can be, uh, can be slow. Our group has a long and successful history of running any logic in parallel on many machines. Once again, Narges, Wade, Winchell um, have done a lot of work with this, with, with Winchell kind of being the grandmaster of this. One might say the king of many kingdoms, and this is one of them. And Winchell has, has done um, a lot of work to make this simpler. Um, Winchell, did Boingo ever play out as a system? Or? Okay. I see, I see. Okay, well, enough said. Um, yeah. Um, but if you're interested in running things in parallel, like running several realizations of a model, there's... There's a lot of opportunities with any logic models for what are called embarrassingly parallel computations. So remember I argued that to get competent results out of an ABM, you don't just want to run it once. You want to run this ensemble. Well, it turns out that you don't need to run the ensemble one at a time. You can run them all at the same time because there's no dependency between them. They're all independent realizations. So you run it on a bunch of machines. And any logic actually supports this in a way uh, if you have the requisite resources. Um, it supports what's called cloud-based execution. And there you execute it over the internet on servers that are set up to execute it. And I haven't used this much, mostly because um, my pockets aren't as deep. Um, as, uh, as so as to, to merit it, and mostly because we don't need to here, um, because we have people like the TAs in the room, um, but I'm sure they could, the TAs could talk with you about it uh, if you are interested in learning more, and they could learn about it as necessary to answer your questions. Um, um, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, performance of any logic models and performance of agent-based models is an important consideration. And if you are doing agent-based modeling at a serious level with population sizes, you know, well above the tens of thousands, the chance is you will sometimes feel the pinch. This is a sphere where light model debugging, um, uh, if you run into challenges, ask some computer scientists. This is a, a sphere where we are set up with the requisite tools to help you, much as mechanics can help you with car problems. We can help you with debugging problems, um, running in a parallel, and language, language problems, understanding how to describe them all. Those play to our training strength, and if you're ever stuck, you need help of that sort, feel, please, please, please be encouraged to reach out to the TAs whose information is shared in that, um, uh, in that file on projects, and you know, you, hopefully they could uh, quickly address uh, your needs um, in, in ways that draw on their their skills and, and build them further. So, any questions about performance issue? If if you're interested in this more, tomorrow would be a great time to work with TAs. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, more around um, number of agents to select. Um, yes. Probably, I guess, while you're feeling Good question. So there's actually rich theory associated with this, and you'll find a paper from me on the subject, which I've long hoped that a student would take up and take to its full fruition. Um, but, but basically, um, what I showed is that there's principled theory behind 
running the same model with a scaled down population and a full size population, there's a principal mapping between the results you get with one and the other. And it's not necessarily just, you know, you run it with half the population size, you just doubled the results, far from it, you know. Um, it actually relates to the dimensional quantities involved and so on. Um, suffice it to say that you're bang on that at a practical level, we often run these models with smaller populations. But you have to be thoughtful about that. You, you can't just say, what the heck, I'll run it with one half the population, when there are certain things in your model that depend on population density, for example. Maybe having the population will mean you get you know, enormously fewer infections going on because people are not proximate to each other like they would in the full in the full simulation. So generally, if we scale something like population, we have to be thoughtful about scaling other things, like the size of the space the agents are in. Because to keep constant certain quantities like density of the population. Um, you know, imagine that with networks, right? You have a radius around you which you're connected. If you only have one-tenth the population size and you keep the same radius of the network to connect to, you may connect with a lot fewer people. And these are well understood things. Physicists, you know, at, from the time of uh, the past few centuries know how to do these things scaling. It's just um, many people who use modeling don't, aren't aware of, of how you go about this. And um, what I'm trying to say here is there is important theory. If you look at my writings on it, you'll find um, some, some pointers to the appropriate literature and, and some exposition of that theory. But what I will say is you don't do it naively. Um, but at a practical level, my students routinely, like day in, day out, they'll run their model on a small population, kind of test it out. Um, and you know, if they do something broken, like don't shrink the size of the space, I'll, I'll point it out. Um, but basically, they'll run it on a small population. And then they'll do some runs with larger populations. You know, maybe they'll run it overnight on a large population, or once a week they'll run it on a large population, um, and and or larger population. And then maybe leading up to a paper or a conference or whatever, you run it on like a full size population or a, a much larger population. So if you talk with Wade or you were talk with Winchell, um, you'd probably find, or, or talk with Young about her diff model, um, you'd probably find that in these models designed to work with hundreds of thousands of agents, most of the runs they run historically um, might be with much smaller numbers. It's just they're frequently enough running it with a large population that they realize nothing is, is problematic. Visualization load is often, uh, also depends on the number of agents. If you have agents running around on your screen, it's got to do a lot of work for those agents. But you're right, it may not scale totally linearly because um, you know, it's a small window on a bigger population, and, and it may be that it's smart about not, not updating all the ones off the screen, but it will probably allocate memory for them. So it's a complicated story. But the basic picture is you go back and forth between small and large, and um, you want to make sure you run it with a large, somewhat large population enough you're not fooling yourself that you know it breaks or something with that. And then sometimes you'll want to gear up and you have production runs where you run it with a, a bigger population and, and maybe overnight or over the weekend or something. Wait, have I missed anything in that in characterizing that that you think very important? It's not smart enough to not do it. Okay. It's so it's really it, dumb about that. Your, Speak on, young man. Yeah, it's all in memory. It draws them all, even if they're off the screen. It's if you, if you get more, if you have actually agents moving around, and you have more than ten thousand agents, it'll probably on most laptops close to unusable. Really? So, so it's smart to use like the headless runs to like find a way. Use a parameter variation experiment. That's that's a good way for beginners to do it, but there's other issues that it doesn't resolve. Like, like memory allocation. Yeah. 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 Is, is that the same if you've got like um like number of clinics or like can you just be smarter about how you dedicate a single icon, maybe it equals 
you know, a shopping center rather than right. a single shop. Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like you oh, can, big time. Yeah, yeah. If, if you, you can have agents with no icon, yeah. mm -hmm. and that represents a huge savings. You can actually, there's an ignore yeah. checkbox in pretty much everything in any logic, mm -hmm. and you can have icons and then ignore them, and then it's like they're not even there yeah. as far as the running model. So, so that's that's uh, and, and it takes a little bit of work to ignore and unignore yes. them, but it's it, it like eliminates this as an issue in terms of memory and so on. So what it really comes down to is like listen to those working with the packages a lot, and they have lots of little tips and tricks and and tools, and hopefully someday, you know, any logic uh, itself will will just make this this issue go away by some you know, um, simple checkbox that says like, like, don't, you know, like, uh, just don't show it for this model. It's like ignoring all the visual shapes or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some there's some complications there, but that's just it. Okay. Um, uh, any other question before I dive into the final presentation? I know I'm keeping you over time here, and and um, uh, I know I'm that you're not alone and. Um, and, and probably uh, uh, having other people seeking to, uh, uh, to talk with you uh, in the evening. Any other questions about this right now? I'm here tomorrow and glad to, to, to talk about all of this, okay? Um, okay, um, great. So I'm going to 